Hey fellow lab rats, this is Rebecca from the Lab Rat YouTube channel. In this video, we're going to be discussing uh, safety in the histology laboratory. All right, let's get started. There are several agencies that are responsible for monitoring laboratory safety. Um, at the time of this lecture recording, um, there are several of these. So um, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, or OSHA, is a government agency that enacts and monitors uh, federal safety, um, including those in the laboratory. A couple examples of OSHA standards that directly relate to the safety of the laboratory are the Hazard Communication Standard of 1987. And the the purpose of this standard is to ensure that the hazards of all chemicals produced or imported are evaluated and the details regarding their hazards are transmitted to employers and employees. OSHA also monitors the bloodborne pathogen standard, um, which was enacted in 1991. So this standard is a regulation that prescribes uh, safeguards to protect workers against health hazards related to bloodborne pathogens or other potentially infectious materials. The Personal Protective Equipment Standard ensures employers provide adequate protective equipment, including uh, personal protective equipment for eyes, face, head and extremities, and protective shields and barriers. And of course, keep this equipment maintained in a sanitary and reliable condition uh, wherever it is necessary. There's also the Joint Commission on Accreditation of Healthcare Organizations, or JCO. Um, so this is an organization that accredits healthcare organizations in the United States and provides them with specific standards, including those for safety for accredited laboratories. The College of American Pathologists, or CAP, is a member-based physician organization that helps to um, uh, uh, credit laboratories. Um, so CAP accreditation requires very detailed and stringent checklists, um, including safety guidelines, and also involves regular inspection of said laboratories. The Environmental Protection a protection agency or EPA is an independent executive agency um, within the federal government that is responsible for the protection of humans health as well as the environment. The CDC or Center for Disease Control is a national public health agency in the United States that serves to protect people from health, safety and security threats. The National Institute of, uh, for Occupational Safety and Health is another U.S. federal agency, and this is responsible for conducting research and making recommendations for the prevention of work-related injury and illnesses. The Clinical and Lab Standards Institute, or CLSI, is a nonprofit educational organization that works to develop national standards and procedures for clinical laboratories. It used to be called the National Committee for Clinical Lab Standards, or N. CCLS, and this is not to be confused with NACLS, uh, which is NAACLS, or the National Accrediting Agency for Clinical Laboratory Science. So the NACLS is, um, approves and accredits educational clinical laboratory science programs, so two separate things here. The OSHA Hazard Communication Standard is also known as the Right to Know Law. So this standard requires that clinical laboratories inform all of their employees of health risks associated with any chemicals they may encounter on the job. The labs must provide a written chemical hygiene plan to help reduce the exposure of employees to hazardous chemicals. Additionally, they must provide adequate training and annual reviews of hazardous chemicals. Laboratories must also obtain and make available material safety data sheets or MSDS for each hazardous com uh, compound available to all employees. So MSDS is a safety data sheet that lists information relating to occupational so safety and health for the use of various substances. So we'll discuss MSDS uh, later on this in this lecture. So it's like a couple slides from now we'll talk about it. The OSHA Bloodborne Pathogen Standard requires that the following must be provided to all employees. A written plan for what happens if an employee is exposed to potentially infectious materials. They must provide adequate training at the beginning of the employee's assignment, as well as with annual reviews. All necessary equipment and supplies for performing a safe job must be provided. And, and if an employee is exposed to hazards while on the job, the employer must provide free testing and treatment to their employee. 
Personal protective equipment or PPE in the lab includes a lab coat, gloves, mask, shields, and goggles. Proper glove use includes replacing the gloves when they become contaminated or damaged. So this means if you're wearing gloves and you get a rip in them, they must be discarded. Or if you get a piece of tissue on them or blood on them, they need to be replaced. Gloves cannot be reused, so you can't wash the gloves and reuse them. <laughs> once they get dirty, you, you got to take them off and replace them. So once you do de-glove or take the gloves off, they must be discarded. Every single time you remove a pair of gloves, you must wash your hands with soap and water. It used to be that laboratories would provide latex gloves, but latex, latex allergies are um, an issue. Um, so most labs have switched over to nitro gloves, and this prevents a lot of reactions that people have with those gloves. So, and latex allergies, you know, of course, can affect the patient. Of course, um, if you if you are wearing those gloves around the patient that has a latex allergy, or you know, you yourself, if you're wearing the gloves and you have a latex allergy. So that's why they've switched over. Um, to those, those nitro gloves. Material safety data sheets, or MSDS, like we discussed a slide or two ago, are safety data sheets that list information relating to occupational safety and health for the use of various substances. The MSDS uh, for each chemical must contain the name of the chemical and the information of the manufacturer. It must also list the ingredients that are hazardous, the chemicals, um, physical and chemical characteristics, um, data on fire, explosion, reactivity, and health hazards. It must also provide control measures and the precautions for the safe handling and use of the specific chemical. Using standard universal precautions in the laboratory, we assume every sample and specimen we receive and test is potentially infectious. There's also a system of controls to help protect laboratory workers by using proper PPE and devices. Things need to be properly labeled, workers need to have education and training adequate to keep themselves safe, and if a worker is exposed, they will need to get medical follow-up following that exposure. There are many different types of safety hazards in the clinical laboratory, the main one being biohazards, so these are infectious microorganisms. Mechanical hazards, which include sharps, uh, sharp hazards like from needles or glass and electrical hazards. Chemical hazards from preservatives or reagents used in the laboratory. There are also fire, ha uh, fire hazards and physical hazards um, can also present problems. So these can be caused by uh, obstruction of walkways, wet floors, um, improper clothing, those types of things. Biohazardous exposure is something that we regularly run the risk of in the histology laboratory. So it's very important that we do everything in our power to prevent exposure. For a substance to be considered infectious, it must contain enough pathogens of sufficient virulence to cause an infectious disease when a susceptible host is exposed to it. In the histology laboratory, we are working with specimens that can potentially cause us harm. So it's vital that universal precautions are followed to prevent biohazard exposure. All human blood, body fluids, and tissue must be treated as if they are infectious. This also includes blocks, slides, and wet tissues. All policies in the laboratory should cover housekeeping, personnel protection, and proper disposal of waste. Specifically for the histology laboratory, frozen sectioning, autopsy, and gross dissection um, are areas of primary concern for biohazard exposure. Always keep personal protective equipment or PPE on when working with biological specimens, so gowns or lab coats, gloves, masks, those types of things. All tissue waste should be deposited in biohazard bags, not thrown in the regular trash. So what are some possible infections or diseases that one can get from working in the laboratory? So HIV or AIDS is possible but infrequent. HIV or human immunodeficiency virus is a virus that attacks the body's immune system and can lead to AIDS or acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. So unfortunately there is no cure for this virus. However, recent treatments, um, new treatments um, allow patients to live um, long healthy lives for the most part with HIV or AIDS. Hepatitis B and C are the most common laboratory associated infections. So these are viruses that primarily affect the liver in patients. Most labs uh, require workers to have a hepatitis B vaccine series. So there's not currently a hepatitis C vaccine available. 
if a laboratory worker is exposed to hepatitis B or C, uh, they can be given immunoglobulin medication to help prevent the infection. Uh, tuberculosis and Creutzfeldt Jakob disease can also pose a risk for laboratory workers, and I'll talk about these on the next slides here. So tuberculosis or TB is another disease that laboratory workers can be exposed to. It is a disease that primarily affects the lungs that is caused by a bacterial called uh, Mycobacterium tuberculosis. Um, currently, there is no OSHA standard on TB, but they do enforce the CDC's recommendations. Proper ventilation, safe work practices, proper use of PPE, and adequate de decontamination protocols in the lab can help to minimize the risk associated with TB. Respiratory protective equipment is also helpful for preventing TB as it can be spread in the air through coughing or sneezing. Creutzfeldt Jakob disease or CJD is a prion disease that infects the nervous tissue. So this leads to changes within the brain cortex and the subcortical white matter of the brain. This is unfortunately a fatal disease and is characterized by changes in mental abilities. It uh, can have a 20 year latency and is very resistant to formalin, organic solvents, enzymes, heat, radiation, freezing, drying, and autolysis. So basically what this means is that it is obviously a very dangerous risk and not many uh, regular methods can kill the prions that cause it so special care needs to be taken with nervous system tissue especially with brain tissue so these are some precautions and methods that need to be taken to be able to kill prions that cause cjd autoclaving at 121 degrees celsius for a one hour period uh, one normal sodium hydroxide for one hour or concentrated formic acid for one hour. Also 5% sodium hydro hypochlorite for two hours. If processing brain sections, they need to be fixed a neutral buffered formalin for a minimum of 48 hours. If processing a whole brain specimen, it needs to be fixed for a minimum of 10 to 14 days. Brain sections then need to be treated in concentrated formic acid for an additional 48 hours, then in formalin for 48 hours. When wasting the formalin that is used for these procedures, it needs to be diluted with two normal sodium hydroxide for one hour and then discarded. If using steel instruments with brain tissue, they need to be processed in one normal sodium hydroxide for one hour, and any PPE used must be incinerated. The grossing table used for this tissue should be cleaned with one normal sodium hydroxide for an hour period. So all these things will help protect the histology laboratory worker from CJD prions. Biohazard bags and sharps containers need to be utilized appropriately in the laboratory. There are four types of potentially infectious waste in the lab, microbiologic or culture material. So this is something that contains bacteria, pathologic material, blood and sharp objects. All of these can be steam sterilized or incinerated, except for pathologic waste. Um, this must just be incinerated. And pathologic waste is considered any human or animal body part. Blood may be disposed of in the sanitary sewer system, like in the sink, um, with copious amounts of water. Any sharps, so glass, needles, blades, etc., must be disposed of in a puncture resistant leak proof container that is labeled with a biohazard identification, like seen in this photo on the right hand side of the this slide. If a lab employee spills a biohazardous material, that spill needs to be cleaned appropriately. Gloves need to be worn. The area first needs to be cleaned from visible blood, then a 10% bleach solution or commercially prepared solution needs to be kept in contact with the contaminated area for at least 20 minutes or as recommended by the manufacturer. If an accident or exposure occurred during the spill, an accident follow-up will need to be made. Um, of course, follow your laboratory procedures for this. Mechanical hazards in the laboratory consist of sharp instruments, glass, and electrical hazards. Microtome knives are a major hazard in the histology laboratory. Exposed ends of the knife should be kept covered with a guard during microtomy. As soon as it is removed from the microtome, the knife should always be placed in its box and remain there. The knife should never be transported outside its closed and latched box. Any used disposable blades in the histology laboratory should be discarded in a puncture-resistant sharps container. All glass should be periodically checked for chips or cracks, as these can easily cut a hand or finger. Vacuum desiccators can be a major hazard if they are cracked as well. 
All electrical equipment should be grounded and wires in good condition. I'll talk more about electrical safety on the next slide. Latex sensitivity, as we've already discussed in this lecture, can cause allergic reactions, so non-latex gloves should be utilized as much as possible. Ergonomics is the science of adapting the working environment to anatomic, physiologic, and psychological characteristics of personnel to enhance their efficiency in the workplace as well as their well-being. The use of ergonomics can help to prevent musco musculoskeletal disorders like carpal tunnel syndrome. I'll talk more about ergonomics in the laboratory in the next couple of slides here. Electrical hazards may also be present within the laboratory. It's important that uh, power cords that are frayed or aging are not used. Um, grounded plugs should always be used. So these are um, the plugs that have three prongs on them instead of two. Um, any worn control switches or thermostats should not be used and extension cords should be avoided. If maintenance needs to be performed on any piece of equipment, uh, that equipment should be unplugged before that maintenance maintenance happens. If hands are wet or in contact with water or body fluids, um, electrical equipment should not be used until the hands are dry. So two slides ago, I introduced the concept of ergonomics. So the greatest risk factors for musculoskeletal disorders in the histology laboratory are the use of manual microtomes, uh, repetitive use of forceps, manual cover slipping, and repetitive opening of tissue cassettes. These tips will help to prevent these disorders from happening. So it's important that if one is performing repetitive tasks uh, to stretch every 20 minutes, um, have tasks rotated between employees and be educated on ergonomics. Many employers have ergonomic training programs for their employees. Minimal force forceps should be utilized with employees taking frequent breaks. If using a computer, employees should keep their wrists in neutral position above the keyboard, keeping their fingers curved. When using a manual microtome, make sure to use the entire arm for complete revolutions of the hand wheel, keeping arms and elbows close to the body, shoulders down, and neck relaxed. It's also important to utilize proper lifting and bending techniques. Bend hips and knees to squat down, grab the object you are lifting, keep it close to your body, and straighten your legs to lift it. Chemical hazards can present toxic, corrosive, fire, and explosion hazards. Recall that the OSHA hazard communication standard is also known as the right to know law. So this standard requires that laboratories inform all of their employees of health risks associated with any chemicals they may encounter on the job. The labs must provide a written chemical hygiene plan to help reduce the exposure of employees to hazardous chemicals. Additionally, they must provide adequate training and annual reviews of hazardous chemicals. And remember, laboratories must also obtain and make material safety data sheets for for each hazardous compound available to all employees. In the laboratory profession, employers must prepare, prepare inventory of all hazardous chemicals and obtain copies of the MSDS, um, which must be accessible to all employees at all times. Employers must label all containers of hazardous chemicals with identity of the chemical and appropriate hazard warnings. Employers must develop a written hazard communication program. They must establish a training program on hazardous substances. Employers must develop a chemical hygiene plan and must establish a means to inform non-employees or personnel from other departments of the hazards that are present within the laboratory workplace. Hazardous chemicals gain access into the body via inhalation, so breathing it in, ingestion, so consuming it, or absorption, so having it absorb into the skin. In the histology laboratory, the biggest concern is inhalation. And when using toxic chemicals, a, uh, a properly working fume hood should be available uh, for use. You'll hear a lot about PEL in the histology profession. The permissible exposure limit, or PEL, is the legal limit in the United States for exposure of an employee to a chemical substance. PELs were developed by OSHA. Um, so, for example, the maximum PEL for formaldehyde is 0 0.75 ppm or parts per million, and the STEL is 2.0 parts per million over a 15-minute period. 
STEL stands for short term exposure limit. So this is the time weighted average or TWA concentration of a substance over a 15 minute period thought not to be injurious to health. A toxic, toxic substance is one that has the potential to cause cancer, tumors, or have other neoplastic effects on a person, uh, induce a permanent transmissible change in characteristics of a person's offspring, uh, cause production of physical defects in the developing human, um, produce death in animals via um, uh, respiratory tract, skin, eye, mouth, or other routes. So if they're exposed to a substance that produces death, um, that can, that's considered a toxic substance. Um, produce irritation or sensitization of the skin, eyes, or respiratory tract. Diminish a, a mental alertness, reduce motivation or alter behavior of humans, and adversely affect health of a normal or disabled person. So all of these classifications um, identify something that would be considered a toxic substance. There are multiple different terms that are associated with describing toxic substances within the laboratory. The term toxic dose low refers to the lowest dose of a substance that will produce any toxic effect in human beings when introduced by any route other than inhalation. So what about those that get into the body through inhalation? So that is referred to as toxic concentration low. The term lethal dose low is the lowest dose of a substance that has been reported to cause death in a human being or as the lowest dose that has caused death in animals. The LD50 is the calculated dose of a chemical toxic substance that is expected to cause the death of 50% of an experimental animal population when exposed to that chemical with any route other than inhalation. The designated area is an area that may be used for work with select carcinogens, toxins that affect reproductive health, or substances that have a high risk of acute toxicity. The designated area can be like the entire lab or a particular area of that laboratory or a fume hood. It's entirely dependent on each laboratory and their practices. Corrosive substances are those substances that with direct contact will corrode SAE 1020 steel at a rate greater than 6.35 nanometers uh, per, per year at 55 degrees Celsius or those that are capable of destroying mild steel under certain conditions. As health hazards, corrosive substances will cause injury to skin, eyes, and severe damage to the respiratory and alimentary tracts. Corrosive substances should avoid contact with metallic surfaces. The National Fire Protection Association, or NFPA, is a nonprofit organization that helps to eliminate death, injury, property, and economic loss due to fire, electrical, and other related hazards. The NFPA has developed a rating system for hazards. It's in a diamond shape with four colored quadrants with a rating scale of zero to four. A picture of this diamond is here on the left-hand side of the slide. So the health hazard is shown in the blue quadrant. Flammability hazard is shown in the red quadrant, instability in the yellow quadrant, and specific hazard is shown in the white quadrant. So the number in each of these quadrants determines the risk. So for example, if there is a four in the blue quadrant, that means it is deadly. Um, three is extreme danger to a person's health, two is hazardous to health, and one is slightly hazardous to health, and zero is a normal material. So each of these quadrants can have a number indicating how hazardous the material is. Symbols can also be used to label things in the lab. So the photo on the left-hand side of this slide shows examples of these symbols. So the symbol denoted A means a flammable hazard, B means a radiation hazard, C means biohazard, and D means poison. If there is a chemical accident, laboratories will have a safety shower and an eye wash station. Um, so on the picture on the right hand side um, shows both a, a it's a combination safety shower and eye wash station. The safety shower, when pulled on the handle, dumps water down on the person standing below it. The eye wash station sprays a steady stream of water out of both faucets when activated. This helps to flush the eyes if a chemical has gotten in them. 
If a worker is involved in a chemical accident, they must immediately remove clothing in the area of the accident and rinse for at least 15 minutes. If the accident involves a chemical exposure in the eye, the worker should use the eye wash station for a minimum of 15 minutes. If an eye exposure occurs and the person is wearing contact lenses, those lenses should be removed before the rinsing begins. After the 15 minutes of rinsing, the worker must go to the emergency room for treatment. Fires are also a hazard when working in the laboratory. There are four different types of fires, denoted by the classes A through D. Class A fires are caused by ordinary combustible materials such as wood or paper. Class B fires are caused by a vapor air mixture over flammable solvents such as gasoline or grease. Class C fires occur in or around electrical equipment and Class D fires involve combustible metals such as magnesium or lithium. As there are different classes of fires, there are different classes of fire extinguishers. So type A extinguishers contain either water or soda and an acid and are, are used to cool class A fires. Type B C extinguishers contain either carbon dioxide, foam, or dry chemicals. Type A B C extinguishers consist of a dry chemical and are used on fires of wood, cloth, paper, oil, grease, and gasoline. Um, a B C extinguishers serve as a multi-purpose in combating uh, fires. In response to a fire, the first thing that needs to happen is to pull the nearest fire alarm, call 911 or hospital's fire emergency number, remove patients from danger. Um, if you're in an, a laboratory that has um, patients, um, like if you're in a hospital laboratory and there's patients around, um, of course the patients won't be in the laboratory itself, but if there's like patients in the hallways or something of that nature, um, close windows and doors. If there's a small fire, use an ABC type fire extinguisher. Leave the area immediately. If you catch fire, drop to the ground and roll and then crawl to the exit. Wherever you work at, the laboratory will have proper protocols for fire drills and emergencies in place. To avoid physical ha uh, hazards in the laboratory, avoid floors that are wet or walkways that have obstructions. Make sure to keep knees bent when lifting to help prevent any injury to the back. Avoid dangling jewelry and keep hair tied back. Also, closed-toed shoes should be worn when in the laboratory to prevent any injury to the feet. These are some general safety practices to follow while working in the laboratory. So laboratory workers need to wash their hands frequently and thoroughly. Food and drink in the laboratory is prohibited, so keep food and drinks in the designated break room area. Wear personal protective equipment or PPE, so these will be provided by the employer and should not leave the lab, especially lab coats. Uh, do not mouth pipette. So it used to be practiced to use the suction of the mouth to pipette liquid. So this is no longer done for hopefully obvious reasons to you. Uh, so don't mouth pipette. Use regular pipettes to do that. Um, it's also important to regularly decontaminate work areas. When performing dilutions with acid and water, the acid needs to be poured into the water, not the water into the acid. If any chemical gets on the skin, the skin needs to be washed immediately. Any chemical that is out of date needs to be discarded appropriately. If a laboratory worker is unsure of the properties of a certain reagent or chemical, it needs to be handled as if it is hazardous. Procedures should be reviewed regularly to determine if there are possible replacements of hazardous reagents by less hazardous substitutes. And if those hazardous chemicals cannot be replaced, their use and amount of stock kept in the laboratory should be minimized as much as possible. In general, the employee's responsibilities for staying safe in the laboratory include participating in safety training programs. These will be mandated by the employer. The employee should also know the location of emergency equipment and also know how to properly use this equipment. The employee should be constantly on alert for unsafe conditions, actions, and chemicals. Uh, they should follow uh, laboratory procedures to avoid hazards and request information regarding any unknown chemical hazards. Every laboratory employee should think, act, and encourage laboratory safety until it just becomes a habit for them. In general, the supervisor's responsibilities for keeping employees safe in the laboratory include providing safety training programs to all employees, provide MSDS sheets for all chemicals and reagents that are used in the laboratory, 
Supervisors are required to keep records of all training uh, with every personnel, as well as the records of any exposed personnel. They should also keep an inventory of all chemicals, dyes, and reagents that are used within the laboratory. Supervisors should be enthusiastic and have a sincere interest in the safety of the laboratory and ensure that employees know that they have the right to know about any dangers or safety concerns present within the laboratory that they are working in. All right, so that concludes our lecture on safety in the histopathology laboratory. If this video helped you out, go ahead and give it a like and please make sure to subscribe to my channel for more educational laboratory content. Until next time.